The Blind Perspective and the Saturday Night Adult Party will not be seen at its usual time. Please stay tuned for a special episode of the Afternoon Radio Theater Sunday on a new day and time. Tune in next week for The Blind Perspective at 4 p.m. Eastern and the Saturday Night Adult Party at 9 p.m. Eastern next Saturday night. The following radio programs are original broadcasts. Blind Perspective and the Saturday Night Adult Party will not be seen at its usual time. Please stay tuned for a special episode of the Afternoon Radio Theater Sunday on a new day and time. Tune in next week for The Blind Perspective at 4 p.m. Eastern and the Saturday Night Adult Party at 9 p.m. Eastern, next Saturday night. The following radio programs are original broadcasts. While enhancements have been made to the audio for clarity and listener enjoyment, no other edits or modifications have been made. The listener may hear advertisements and notices for tobacco products, alcohol, food, and or services that may no longer be available nor are they endorsed by whose blind life is it anyway. Listener discretion is advised. Hey everybody, it's Pepsi Mama, and welcome to another edition of the Afternoon Radio Theater Sunday, like an ice cream sundae. That's how it's spelled, but if you just want it to be a relaxing Sunday, then that's fine too. It's your Sunday. But, um... I'm glad to have you. Uh, I'm Pepsi Mama, and in the background doing all the technical stuff is uh, Victor Govea. And um, if not for him, I wouldn't have a show to do, bless his heart. Um, I just thank the world of him for having this channel that we can all participate on. Um But if you want to listen to us live, you can listen to us on Facebook and YouTube at Whose Blind Life Is It Anyway? Uh, And you can also like us and subscribe to us and all that kind of stuff on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, on Twitter, you can um, find us at Blind Who's, B-L-I-N-D-W-H-O-S-E, and you can uh, follow us there, and we'd be glad to have you. Um, if you, for whatever reason, can't or don't want to listen to us live, you, you can uh, find us on most any podcast player. So, um I don't know of any that it's not on, but sure as I say it's on all of them, there'll be somebody who can't find it on one of them, so there you go. But um, anyway, y'all kick back and enjoy the show, and if you want to 
send me requests or, um, you know, or, um, what you like or, you know, um, what you hope I don't play or whatever, <laughs> then, um, you can send me an email at afternoon radio theater Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-E, like an ice cream, afternoon radio theater Sunday at gmail.com. And I'm always glad to have your requests. In fact, I've got, a, I put a couple on, um, last week and I've got a few more out today. And, um, so this first one that I'm going to play for you, it's, it's the fat man. And, uh, he's kind of a, he's a detective, but he's a, uh, he's a grumpy old thing. He's not a jolly fat man at all. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, but I tell you what, he's, if he's a fat man though, he's, uh, he sounds like he works out, so I don't know. But, um, Anyway, this one is called Murder Squares the Triangle. There he goes into that drugstore. He's stepping on the scales. Weight 239 pounds. Fortune, danger. Who is it? The Fat Man. emotion. A soft, sweet, warm, deep dream for two. But for two, strictly. When comes a third dreamer latching his wagon to the lullaby train, the dream becomes a nightmare and has a nasty habit of turning into reality, the grim reality of murder. And now, here's the fat man in... Murder Squares the Triangle. I was broiling myself a brace of double line lamb chops when my doorbell rang at half past six. I answered the door, and when she told me her name, I let the chops burn. Her husband, Mr. John C. Kinnard, was famous as a hot-headed but well-heeled gentleman who could write a check with six zeros. And I always say, rich or poor, it's good to have money. So I asked her in. You must excuse me for coming to your home, but it was urgent. You need a detective, Mrs. Kinnard? No, I need to get rid of one, Mr. Runyon. That could stand a little clarification. I know. The fact is this. My husband's hired a detective to follow me. It's John's considered opinion that I'm... Well, that I'm running around. And of course you're not. Of course I'm not. Believe me, my husband's attitude is completely without foundation. Okay. What is it you hope I can do for you? I want you to call this man off. The detective? Yes. Frighten him. Make him stop tormenting me. What method would you suggest? Oh, there must be a way of handling such a man. Mr. Runyon, if there isn't, I may not be alive tomorrow morning. You won't be alive? No. Why not? My husband, he... He'll kill me, Mr. Runyon. You're not straining your imagination, are you? Oh, I wish I were, but it's all real. The detective phoned me this morning. Phoned me and openly demanded that I give him $10,000 in cash, or else he's going to talk to John. What can he say? You told me there'd been nothing but sweetness and life. He's going to make up a lie, a hideous lie. Now, let me get this straight. He's manufactured a character, Mr. Bunyan. Tim Foster, he calls him. Timothy J. Foster. 
And he swears he's going to hand John a report to the effect that he spied on Mr. Foster and me under very compromising circumstances. I can't imagine a man like John C. Kinnard falling for a gag like that. But the awful thing is he will. Without investigating? He'll shoot first and investigate later. What's the matter with him? We all have our diseases, I suppose, and jealousy is John's. A thing like this is all he needs to turn into a raging lunatic. You've got to help me, Mr. Runyon. You've got to do something. Okay, okay. What's the detective's name? Stanley. Fritz Stanley? That cheap bloodsucker. You know anything about him, Mr. Runyon? The landy. What? Nothing I'd care to mention in mixed company, Mrs. Kinnard. <laughs> had spoken highly of a personal checking account, and the fee we agreed on made beautiful music. I knew Tanley wouldn't take orders from me, but remembering that the legal name for the gag he was working was fraud, I scraped the lamb chops out of the broiler and put on my hat. The phony in question made his headquarters on the dingy fifth floor of the Graham House on Willis Street, and when I knocked on his door a little while later... I found him in. Well, look who's here. Santa Claus's boy. What brings you here, handsome? Come in. Thanks. Word is that you want to cash in big on a little game of tag you're working for Mr. John Kinnard. Anything wrong with that? As I hear it, you're threatening to make report on the antics of your client's wife with a Mr. Timothy Foster. And... And it wouldn't take a genius to nail you for fraud, Stanley, if it happens that Foster doesn't exist. Yeah. To coin a phrase, yeah. Who has it's got this idea that Foster doesn't exist? Not Mrs. Kinnard, by any chance. By every chance. <laughs> must be a pretty funny sensation for her, then. What must be? Getting mail from a party who don't exist. What are you talking about? This. This letter, Onion, Exhibit A in my defense for Ford. May I glance over it? Help yourself. Thanks. I hold on to it. Spell it out from where you are. Dear Kathleen, meet me tonight in the room at 26 Cabot Road. I'll be waiting at 8. Your own Timothy. How does that sound to you? Stylish stout. Where'd you get that? The bimbo Mr. Kinnard loves tossed it into a corner wastebasket early this a.m. <laughs> what happened to the fraud conviction, powerhouse? You plan to show that to your client, Tanley? Me? No. No, I don't plan to show it to him, Brian, because I already did. You don't say. Twenty minutes before you gum shoot in. <laughs> said a quarter to wait. To Mrs. Kinnard, I owed nothing except a loaded cigar. But I knew that if she kept that eight o'clock appointment, there'd be more fireworks than a Chinese New Year. So I left my gruesome brother detective, grabbed a taxi, and gave the address on Cabo Road. My watch showed a shade after the hour as I got out of the cab and rang the bell. I'd rung it three times before I saw the door was off the latch. So I went in. Fourth of July. I'm Brad Runyon, Mrs. Kinnard. Remember me? Who's the man in the floor? It's my husband. Your husband? Yes. I see John came with a gun in his hand. What happened? A slight case of backfire? Tell me. Is he dead? He sure is. Oh, it can be. It can be. It's been, sweetheart. Sealed and stamped. The question before the house now is where is the tenant? What? Where has he taken himself? I don't know who you mean, Mr. Runyon. Your friend, Mrs. Kinnard. My friend? The reference is to Timothy Foster. I told you this morning, Mr. Runyon, there's no such person as... You can cancel that speech, sweetheart. 
As it happens, I heard you screaming his name when I opened the front door. You did it. Clear as a bell. Now, where is Foster? Who's Foster, Mr. Runyon? The man who was here with you when your husband walked in, Mrs. Kennard. The man who shot first while waiting to be shot at, and then took a two-story leap into the hydrine just through this window here. Really? Where will I find him? Tell me, or I promise you, pretty as you look, you'll hang as high as a Christmas goose. You know you're less attractive when you scowl. Where's Foster? Where does he live? What is it you two are making here, mister? Huh? Oh, who are you? Me? Pedersen. Janitor. I think it was maybe from here a big noise, no? Reasonably big. The man on the floor is only dead. Yar? Yar. What do you know about Mr. Foster? Mr. Foster? The man you rented this room to, remember? I not rent rooms. Not no tenants. My place is in the basement. Somebody rents these rooms. Who is it? Mrs. Heufels. She rents them. And where is she? He's on trip away to her mother's. When does she get back? He tell me she come home tomorrow at 12 o'clock. Well, that's the ball game, Mrs. Kennard. What do you mean? I mean you may as well open up. Mrs. Heufels is going to keep no secrets. She's seen Foster, she's dealt with him, and she'll talk so fast and loud. We'll know enough to land him in jail by tomorrow noon. Really? Really. And look, sweetheart, you're standing on the threshold of trouble deluxe. If you take good advice, you... Oi, 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 what's this? They're overdue already. Yeah, yeah, the police. Somebody else here, big noise. Somebody sent for them. Well, this is it, sugar plum. There are going to be questions, lots of questions. There could even be confusion. You're so efficient. You're pretty, too, but this is no time for orchids. John C. Kinnard was a mogul in this man's town, and his murder won't go unsung. The newspapers will make such a noise, there'll have to be a conviction. It's nice of you to care, Mr. Runyon. Do I have to tell a woman of your intelligence that your own safety's at stake, Mrs. Kinnard? Do I have to tell a man of your intelligence that Timothy means more to me than my own safety, Mr. Runyon? And so it stood. She didn't bat an eye when the minions of the law crashed in, looked over the room, and took it to headquarters. But half an hour later, after a phone call, there was an attorney in Mrs. Kinnard's detention cell with a writ of habeas corpus and $50,000 in bail money. While they'd held her, they'd gotten strictly nothing out of her. And all Lieutenant Mackenzie knew about Mr. Timothy Foster was his name. So next morning, I decided I'd pay a call on the landlady of 26 Cabo Road, who was due back at noon from a visit to her mother's. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Hartholz? What is it you want? Like everybody else in town, I'm interested in last night's murder. Go away, Frank, here now, and don't bother. Uh, you haven't started being bothered yet, Mrs. Heifels. Wait till the DA gets here. The DA? He, he, he's going to come here? In time, and not a lot of time at that. He's bound to. But if we get together and have the right kind of talk, we might manage between us to keep the police away altogether. So, come inside. Who are you? Private detective. What is it you want to know? All about him. Who? Your second floor boarder. And who is it will look out for me? Why does anybody have to look out for you? That's the way it is. From a distance it looks easy, and the next thing you know, the world is on your head. I'm afraid I don't quite follow you, Mrs. Hoyt. Of course not, of course not. How could you? Go in the dining room and keep quiet. Why all the secrecy? Do what I tell you. Just sit down over there and we'll bring all this to finish. That's what I want. Wait till I close the door. You may wonder why I'm being so careful, but if anybody heard it, it might be dangerous. <laughs> Finished 
come from an unexpected angle. A gunshot, sudden and deafening, from far down the long and dim-lit corridor. I was across the room in two strides, but already the hall was as empty as a fireplace in July. Mrs. Hoyfel stumbled forward and fell. She fell under a picture of herself on the wall. A picture taken when she was very young. And very alive. Teufels lay dead on the carpet. With her passing on my best hope for a fast finale to the Kennard killing. When I broke the news to Lieutenant Mackenzie, I could hear the ragged edge of despair in his voice. To soften the blow a little, I pointed out that now at least we knew Foster had been in the neighborhood as late as 12.15. After I hung up and sat a while in quiet speculation, my mind suddenly focused on a certain detective. A hard-bitten gent who had been overlooked. And as soon as the police arrived, I took my way once again to the Graham house on Willis Street. Beat it, Runyon. Take it easy, Tamley. Take it easy. I told you to beat it. Is that the way to talk to a friendly colleague? The friendly colleague will either take himself a walk... Go on in and (laughs) sit down. (coughs) What have you got with me, powerhouse? Not much. Only a certain John C. Kinnard, who earned his money the hard way, might be alive today to enjoy it. If you hadn't stuck that note under his nose and let him go off on a rampage to get lead in his chest. I did what I was paid for. Why do you come off telling me my business? It just seems to me that the detective who actually spotted Foster with Mrs. Kinnard ought to have a pretty clear picture of what he looks like. Hmm. Did you figure that all by yourself? With a minimum of prompting from the audience. You say you saw him, Tanley. And who say him not? How often did you see him? Often. How close? Close enough to know. Then let's have it. He's about six foot one, brown hair, gray eyes, walks with a cane and drives a black 41 Ford Sinclair. Thanks for the information, Tanley. I'll pass it along. <laughs> Timothy Foster wanted for double murder. Description follows. Height six one, hair brown, eyes gray. Attention, old state patrols. Murder of John C. Kin out at large. Post guards at old toll bridges and highway entrances. Stop all suspicious vehicles with particular attention to black 41 sedan. Attention, all National Police Headquarters. Arrest on site, Timothy J. Foster. Height 6'1", hair brown, eyes gray. Uses cane and drives 41 sedan. This man is a dangerous killer. And I did pass it along to the police, who broadcast it near and far. For 12 hours, the homicide squad struggled along on not a wink of sleep. And from all this labor, they scored a very circular goose egg. It crossed my mind that Tanley could have given me a bum steer. And shortly thereafter, I felt a craving for that note which Foster had written to his beloved Kathleen. I phoned police lieutenant Mackenzie and asked him to drop in on the gumshoe and confiscate the note as vital evidence. Then I decided to pay a call on Mrs. Kinnard. I've heard the description of of Timothy on the radio. It's quite accurate, Mr. Runyon. And complete? Complete. Believe me, I'd tell you if it was otherwise. I'm not interested in shielding him any longer. No. No. What happened? I've had time to realize what a fool I made of myself. None of it was necessary. I was just running around with Foster to taunt John. Oh, I see. To make him jealous. I was afraid he was taking me for granted. You see... I really love my husband. That is news. It's gone now, and I can never undo what was done, but well, I'm making every attempt to have deserved him. That's a little after the fact, Mrs. Kinnard. Tell me, how do you do such a thing? Well, for instance, his monument. I've written the epitaph myself, see? Here it is. 
What do you think of it? John C. Kennard, a brave and generous soul, survived by his loving wife, Tina. Nice. Lovely. But who's Tina? Me. I thought your name was Kathleen. Oh, I was christened Kathleen, but to people who love me, I've always been Tina. I left her and went down to the drugstore for chocolate malt. Then, say, ten minutes later, I made a call to Mackenzie and asked him if he confiscated the note written by Foster arranging the fatal date with Mrs. Kinnock. He said he had. I then wanted to know if he had a handwriting expert on tap, someone who could not only analyze it, but write it. Again, the answer was yes. There was a graphologist named Mercer in the lab, and he was, at that moment, studying the note in question when Mackenzie switched me over. Mercer speaking. This is Brad Runyon. Oh, yes, Mr. Runyon. Do you have the Foster note nearby? Yes, yeah, it's in front of me. You want me to analyze it? No, I want you to copy it. Copy it? Yeah, stroke for stroke, and write out the following. You got a pen? Yes, sir. Okay, here goes. To the police. What's that? Right what I tell you. To the police. Mrs. Kennard killed her husband. Yeah. I'm leaving town because I don't want to be involved. Yeah. But I saw her pull the trigger. Have you got that? Yes, sir. I'll have her done in half an hour. Okay. Sign it, Timothy Foster. I went over to headquarters and arranged with Mackenzie to take out the little document. And then went calling on that gentleman of the old school, Fritz Tanley. Hiya, Tanley. What? No cops this time? No, no cops. This visit's off the record, Fritz. Nice to see you so sociable. Sit down. What's on your mind? The Kinnard case is about to close. Huh? Thought you'd like to know. After all, you've been so close to it. What's the matter? Well, nothing, nothing. What should be the matter? You look surprised. After all, a case has got to go sometime. Who says not? Well? Well, what? What's the payoff? Who did it? A certain much-discussed bimbo. Mrs. John C. Kinnard. Kathleen, Tina, the dead man's wife. You must be nuts. Why, Fritz? Well, well, I mean, how you, how you figure Oh, new piece of evidence clinched the deal. What piece of evidence? This note. Exhibit B. It is a, a note. To quote you, Fritzy, it is not a piece of deal. Can I see that? Sure, from where you're sitting. You're far-sighted. Spell it out. Mrs. Kinnard killed her husband. I'm leaving town because I don't want to be involved, but I saw her pull the trigger. Who wrote that? The signature's there. Timothy Foster. And the script is identical with the first note. The one about the date on Cabo Road. You can see now why I say the case is about to close, huh, Fritzing? Uh, yeah. You're the first person to see this little billet do. Where'd it come from? Under a sofa cushion in Foster's room at the boarding house. You found it, I take it? Who else? What kind of angle are you looking to cut here? Isn't it all too obvious? It's N.G., Runyon. Why? Because she didn't kill Kinnard. You mean you don't think she killed Kinnard? That's right. I don't think she killed Kinnard. Okay, you have a right to your opinion, family. But nevertheless, she's it. Wait a minute. For what? You can't pin a rap on her with that note, Runyon. No, oh, I think I can. The D.A. is hungry for conviction, and so is McKenzie. Tina will do. What do you mean, she'll do? I mean it has to be somebody, so it might as well be her. So long, Fritz. Hey, wait, wait. Listen. Mackenzie's waiting for me, family. She's innocent. She didn't do it, I tell you. She didn't do it. I can make out a pretty nice case. She had motive and opportunity. What about the murder weapon? I've got that, too. Found it in the hydrangea bush outside the window. You're a liar, you dirty swine. 
What do you mean? You haven't got the murder weapon. Who says I have? I say you haven't. Why not? Because here's the murder weapon. Right here. That's all. And it's going to come in real handy again. What do you mean? To put a slug in a too smooth operator. Me by name? Who else by name? Foster didn't write that note. You had it written. How can you be so sure? Foster could have written it, couldn't he? You know all about it. Powerhouse? That I can see. You mean that there's no such person as Timothy Foster? Could that possibly be what you mean? Couldn't be that you invented him out of thin air to be a fall guy. Yeah. It could be. Could it be that you did more than trail Mrs. Kennard? That you caught up with her, fell in love with her, and invented a man named Foster to lure Kinnard into the trap of 26 Cabell Road? It's possible. And it's what happened. Yes, it's what happened. You rented the room from Mrs. Heufels as Foster. And when she was about to talk, you killed her, cool and deliberate. So she wouldn't upset your dream of a blue heaven with Tina Kinnard and her husband's millions. Was that the play, Fritzy? Exactly, King Size. And now, before we wind up your shining career, can I ask one? The floor is yours. How did you know, Wallace? Just one of those nasty gags that nobody can count on, did the chick, Fritzy? When you wrote that first fake love note from Foster to Mrs. Kinnard, you had him address her as Kathleen. And then today, unsolicited, the lady tells me that to people who love her, she's always Tina. You knew from that? From that, I started thinking. Not bad, William. At my best, I'm very good. But not good enough to stick my girl with a trumped-up gimmick and get away with it. I never planned to stick her, Tanley. What do you mean? Oh, this was to get you to hand out a confession. Confession? To Lieutenant Mackenzie, who's standing on the other side of that door out in the hall. For a moment, he doubted me. Then he decided I was on the level and turned, firing as he swung. The bullets went wild, nosing into the door frame. Before a third slug could better his score, Mackenzie opened fire. And Tanley grabbed his chest and pitched forward like a sack of grain. I'll get it, Mac. Hello? Hello, darling. Who's this? It's Tina, sweetheart. How are you, Tina? You... You don't sound like yourself. Is this Mr. Tanley? No. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is Mr. Tanley there? Yes. May I speak with him, please? I'm afraid you can't. Why not? Because, Tina, Mr. Tanley's dead. Oh, no. No. Yes, sweetheart. And I think you'll find that little boy Blue will be blowing his horn in front of your house shortly, so don't go away. <laughs> Mackenzie took over then. As I left, he said little, but meant much. And he watched me descend as the wire cage elevator groaned me down to the lobby level. Now, out in the street and at the corner of 4th and Willis, there was a fruit stand with a pyramid of rosy wine saps, where I stopped and bought a sackful. Then I went on my way thinking that love is a nice emotion, a soft, Sweet, warm, deep dream for two. But strictly for two. Strictly. seems I spend my life in getting into trouble and getting out of it. But at the same time, I generally manage to get some other people in and out of trouble, too. Be seeing you again. Bye-bye. 
Next, I have for you one called Favorite Story. And um, it's about a man who sells his soul to the devil. In fact, that's the name of it, really. The man who sold his shadow to the devil. Which, um, And so, um, you know, you may or may not believe in such things. I don't know. But um, it's fun to listen to anyway. <laughs> But I'll be back in just a few minutes to get started on the Sunday. This is Ronald Coleman inviting you to radio's most dramatic half hour, Favorite Story. one surefire way of spotting the devil. Uh, in case you should have the misfortune of running into him on a trolley car or in the bleachers at a ball game, the devil has no shadow. None. Stand him up beside a good hundred-watt bulb and there won't be darkness on any side of old Nick. Now, you can imagine that this shadowless condition causes the devil a great deal of embarrassment. And you can also imagine that there would be almost nothing old Satan wouldn't do in order to correct this uh, sad omission. Which brings us to our favorite story for this week. The strange and staggering account of the man who sold his shadow to the devil. This fantasy was dreamed up by a German botanist with the incredible name of Louis Charles Adelbert von Hamiso. And it was selected as the favorite story of one of America's greatest poets. The distinguished man of letters, Mr. Robert Frost. So here it is. Robert Frost's favorite story, The Man Who Sold His Shadow to the Devil. No, 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 no! But, sir... Mina and I are in love. We want to be married as soon as possible. You don't have very good ears, Peter. I said no. I can't believe you'd stand in the way of your daughter's true love. Oh, yes, I would, Peter. I'd stand in your way. Tell me, how much money have you got in round figures? Well, very little. Uh, how little? Nothing. You see, my daughter must be provided for. Can't have her trotting off to the altar with every bumpkin who announces himself as her true love. I'm not ashamed of being poor. Together, Mina and I can make our way. And what about me? You? Yes, me. My daughter's a beautiful woman. A negotiable asset, I think the bankers would say. When she falls in love, it will be with someone who can take excellent care of her. And me. What about her happiness? Happiness, Peter, is round, shiny, golden... Makes a sound like this. Money man. Poor, selfish. And practical, Peter. You're beginning to bore me. Do you mind leaving? Sir, I have never been so insulted. Good day to you. Good day. Oh, one other thing, Peter. Yes. You will make me ecstatically happy if I never see you again as long as I live. Then what did he say? He called me a bumpkin. And he said I bored him. And he ordered me out of the house. Oh, that's father. Oh, Mina. We can't let him ruin everything for us. Let's be married anyhow. Peter, how can we? What would we live on? If I only had some money. Or a position. Peter, you're going to get one. One what? A position. How? Socially. Socially? Other people get positions that way, Peter. Positions that pay good money. And if you're making good money, Father won't object to you. You know Father. Yes, I do. I know. I know just what we'll do. We're going to a party tonight. Where? At the big house on North Street Hill. I read about it in the paper. A Mr. Uh, 
Mr. Jones is giving it. I think that's his name. He's dreadfully rich, Peter, and he must have hundreds of good positions to give away just for the asking. And you'll ask him for one tonight. But, but darling, we weren't invited to the party. Peter, if we hold our heads very high and act very cold and very rude, who will know us from the invited guests? <laughs> Isn't this exciting, darling? The violins, the jewelry, all the beautiful people. Mina, that man over there, he's looking at us strangely. He's looking at everybody strangely. Stop worrying, Peter. All the same, Mina, I'd rather... Oh, look, there's a count. A count? Nobility, Peter. A real-life count. And a baron. And a duke. You realize a duke is almost a prince? Oh, wouldn't it be heavenly to be a princess? I'd be quite happy if I was just a plain, everyday count. Peter. Hmm? There's Mr. Jones right by the staircase. It's his party. Darling, let's go home. Oh, Peter, Peter, Peter. If you love me, if you want to marry me, you'll march right up there to Mr. Jones and tell him to give you a position. It's our only hope. All right, Mina. I'll do it. Because I love you. I'll be right behind the banister listening. <laughs> and then, Your Excellency... The old man turned to the fish peddler and said... Uh, Mr. Uh, Jones? No, he said... Uh, uh, well, who are you? I've got to talk to you. I'm telling the Baron a story. This is very important. I want a position. You do? A good position with good pay. Well, doesn't everybody? <laughs> I'm, I'm very serious, Mr. Jones. Yes, yes, yes I can see that. Well, tell me, young fellow. What can you do? Oh, uh, anything and everything. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I wouldn't hire you if you were the last man on earth. Why not? Because you're stupid and a bumblehead and because you spoiled my story. <laughs> now, as I was telling you, Baron, <laughs> the old man turned to the sea. Mina, uh, Mina. Oh, there you are. I, I heard what Mr. Jones said. Mina, I'm sorry. I heard everything. I... Mr. Jones is right. Father's right. You are a bumblehead, and you'll never amount to anything as long as you live. Oh, Mina, my precious darling. Now, don't you start saying nice things to me, Peter. It won't do you any good. I've made up my mind. You needn't trouble yourself calling on me anymore. I won't care to see you. Good night, Mr. Nobody. Mina. I'll see myself home, don't you, Father? Oh, Mina. You, you can't just... Go away and leave me. I've been watching you. What? I say, I've been watching you. Uh, I know. I, I don't belong here. I, I wasn't invited. I'm going now. I wasn't invited either. I... You weren't? I just came. Uh, well, so did I. <laughs> I've been watching you, Peter. How do you know my name? I've been listening, too. How can Jones be so cruel to you, so harsh and unkind? Do you know Mr. Jones? I've had my dealings with him, and I can assure you without fear of contradiction that Mr. Jones is a man without a soul. It isn't just his being rude to me. It, it's that I've, I've lost Mina. Such a fine girl. She is a fine girl, and I love her with all my heart, and she loves me. But I have to make some money and prove myself to her. Peter... I think I can be of some help to you. Can you find me a position? Some very profitable work? <laughs> I have gained quite a reputation for my ability to find work for idle hands. Peter. Peter, please. Stand there, away from the wall. I don't quite... Understand. There. There in the clear moonlight. It's beautiful. Just stand there in the moonlight, Peter. And let me look at it. Let me drink it in. So clean and sharp and black. I don't understand. Peter, I want to buy your shadow. You want to... Oh, oh you're making a joke with me. What's the matter? Isn't your own shadow good enough for you? <laughs> it's very cruel of you to laugh. Many years ago, I had an unfortunate accident, and it was necessary to... 
to amputate my shadow. Look here. Here, when we stand side by side in the moonlight. Two of us standing here. But only one shadow. Yes. Isn't it dreadful? <laughs> Not really, of course. It's, it's just a whim of mine wanting a shadow. I, I don't know what earthly use it would be. You can't eat it or wear it. You can't even talk to it. I suppose after a while it even gets to be something of a nuisance following you around. How can you take my shadow? Don't ask questions, Peter. But rest assured that once you give your permission, I can transfer your shadow as easily as we might exchange a pair of shoes. What will you give me for it? I believe you mentioned something about needing money to satisfy your sweetheart and impress her father. Yes, yes. I advise you to shield your eyes, my friend, when you gaze into this velvet bag, which I happen to be carrying beneath my greatcoat. Here. Go. Oh. A whole satchel full of gold. Yes. Run your hand through it, Peter. But it must be a fortune. Only a fortune? <laughs> Much more than that. Watch. There. And there. Stop. It's plain sinful to throw gold away like that. We wouldn't want to do anything sinful, would we? Peter, open the velvet bag. What do you see? Still full. Full to the brim. Yes. My friend, I am offering you an endless supply of gold. All the money, all the riches a man ever possessed. For no matter how much you spend from this velvet bag, it will never be empty. Yours, Peter. If you give me your shadow. I... I don't know. Think what this means. A castle, Peter. Rich clothes. A title, if you like. Wealth can make you a nobleman. All yours, Peter. If you give me your shadow. A castle. And a title. Think what it will buy. Respect from men like Jones. The admiration of Mina's father. The hand of the lovely Mina herself. Yours, Peter, if you give me your shadow. It, it doesn't seem right. Right? What has your shadow ever done for you? Has it brought you honor, fame, distinction, love? No, it has changed you to the earth, this shadow. Be done with it, Peter. And claim the happiness which belongs to you. Yours, the instant you give me your shadow. Take the shadow and give me the purse. Done. There's my part of the bargain. And now, Peter. Now, if you will just stand where you are in the moonlight. That's fine. I grasp your shadow firmly above the shoulders. And I tug gently at first to loosen it. And then I... Pull and pull and I pull. Oh, see, <laughs> see, it fits me perfectly, just my size. <laughs> look, look how it follows me around. I'm its master. It has to do everything I do. Oh, at last, at last, I have a shadow. And I have a bottomless purse of gold. <laughs> yes, you have a bottomless purse of gold. <laughs> you poor fool. <laughs> Continue now with the second act of Favorite Story, chosen for us by the great American poet, Mr. Robert Frost. It would seem offhand that our friend Peter had made himself a rather good bargain in selling his shadow to the devil, but there is a well-founded rumor, I believe, that contracts with the Prince of Darkness have an unfortunate habit of turning into boomerangs. Let's find out what Peter's doing now with his bottomless purse of gold. <laughs> Uh, 
Fiddler? Fiddler! Yes, Mr. Peter? I want to hear something slow. Very good, Mr. Peter. Bendel? Bendel! Where are you, Bendel? Coming, sir. Coming, Mr. Peter. You'll have to be more punctual, Bendel. I demand punctuality from my servants. I understand, Mr. Peter. I was merely following your orders. I was in the East Chamber counting the gold. And how much did you find? In the East Chamber, 15,412 florins of pure gold. And in the West Chamber? In the West Chamber, 18,940 guilders of pure gold. And the velvet satchel still full to the brim. Fiddler! A waltz! Yes, Mr. Peter. Mr. Peter. I don't like the sound of that. Any poor bumblehead of a farmer's son can be a mister. I want a title. Uh, Bendel! Uh, yes, Mr. Peter. Go buy me a title. I beg pardon, sir? There must be a hundred bankrupt noblemen who would gladly exchange a tattered coat of arms for the gold in my east chamber. Well, Bendel, what are you waiting for? Go buy me a title. Uh, yes, sir. Whatever you say, sir. Fiddler! Yes, Mr. Peter? Play me something with majesty, pomp, magnificence. Something fitting to nobility. Very well, sir. But I am only one fiddler. I am rich. Why should I not have two fiddles? Five fiddles. A whole orchestra. Peter, my dear, dear boy, Mina and I are delighted about your good fortune. Delighted. You mean uh, you would no longer stand in the way of our marriage? Oh, now, whatever gave you that silly idea? Mina loves you, and I wouldn't think of interfering with her happiness. Of course not. Where is Mina? Well, I've brought her here to see you. She's waiting in the hall. I'll go to her. As for you, sir, you are beginning to bore me. Huh? Do you mind leaving? Well, I... And you I, make I, me ecstatically I, happy if I never see you again as long as I live. Well, my, my, my dear Peter... Now you I, can get out. Good day. Uh... Good day to you, Peter, sir. Ah! <laughs> oh, Mina, my darling, my precious. Why, what's wrong with Father? He ran past me like a frightened rabbit, with his hat on backwards. I must have frightened him. No matter. He approves of our marriage now, darling. So there's nothing to stand in our way. That is, if you still want me. Oh, Peter, you know I want you. I always have. I always will. Darling, Mina. We must make our plans. When will the wedding be? Tonight? Tomorrow? Oh, so soon? Why not? Come out in the garden, my sweet, and your husband will pick you a bridal bouquet with his very own hands. Oh, oh the flowers are lovely, Peter. It seems a pity to pluck them away from their warm sunlight. What difference does it make? I have gold enough to buy the sun itself. Peter, where did it come from? Where did you get this fortune? Uh, an inheritance, sir. Uh, a distant relative. Oh, Darling, I'm so happy. Aren't we the luckiest people in the whole world? The luckiest. And by far the richest. Peter, isn't that curious? What, dear? Why, there doesn't seem to be any shadow where you're standing. No shadow? Now, what do you suppose would cause that? Uh, I don't know. Don't tell me you're a magician of some sort. Peter, what's wrong? You look pale Get in the house. But I... In the dark. We must get out of this cursed sunlight. Uh, uh, that's better. Why, what's wrong with you, Peter? Nothing. Nothing. Out there in the garden. Why didn't you cast a shadow? Because I don't have a shadow. You have no shadow. Only the devil has no shadow. Oh, Mina, you're wrong. The devil has a shadow. He has mine. you a title, sir. Uh, you're a count now, and everyone must call you Count Peter. Will that make her love me, Bendel? Will that make her come back? Who, sir? My bride, my precious Mina. 
She's horrified at the sight of me. Bendel, you must run another errand. Yes, Count Peter. Go to the hotel. Find a stranger, if he's still there. What name he goes by, I don't know. A man with a black cloak, black eyes, a pointed beard. Find him, Bendel. Find him and send him to me. <laughs> Everywhere, Count Peter, sir. Nobody knows where this... I'll see who that is. No, I don't want to see anyone. Well... You can't come in. My master won't see anyone. It's all right, then. It's Nina's father. Well, sir, what do you want? I want to see if it's true. What are you talking about? It's so dark in here, Peter. So terribly dark. Do you always keep your curtains drawn like this? Stay away from there! Stand where you are. Or are you afraid the afternoon sunlight won't make a shadow for you? Pull back the curtain! So, it is true. You have no shadow. Get out of here. It's a pleasure. Before night, the town will know about this. The whole town will know what an unnatural devil you are. <laughs> Broken every window in the house, Bendel. Yes, sir. Bendel, look at me. Hold the lamp high and look at me. Well, do I frighten you? Yes, you do, sir. I say that you're in league with the devil, sir, and it terrifies me. I have no friends left. I might as well be dead. Bendel, take what money there is to get out of here before they kill you, too. Or burn you at the stake for being in league with me. But where are you going, Count Peter? Uh, I don't know. Yes, I do know. The crag by the big precipice. Surely in the world of shadows, there will be one left over for me. Such a high place. Such a far journey. Goodbye, Mina. Forgive me. Now, I wouldn't do that, Peter. You! Yes. I'm always around when there's a good bargain to be had. Now, before you jump, perhaps we can affect another little trade. What do you mean? How would you like your shadow back? How would I? <laughs> oh. You missed it, did you? Uh, I'll give you everything for it. The purse, all the money, everything. No need. You can keep the purse and have your shadow back, too. What do you want in exchange? A simple commodity, hard to find on the open market. You see, my young friend, some people collect coins or stamps or antiques. My hobby is slightly different. I collect second-hand souls, slightly used sometimes, but in good condition. Get away! Now, if you'll just sign this little agreement, I will transfer back your shadow in fine condition and completely renovated. This is the standard contract. Don't bother to read the small type. I, the undersigned, hereby transfer all rights to my soul, immortal and otherwise, etc., etc. Sign here. Get away, devil! I want no more of your trades! I never force a sale. The customer is always right. Uh, but, Peter, should you ever care to reconsider this transaction... You need only to rattle the purse, like this. See? Just a simple flutter of the wrist, and I'll be here in an instant. And we can make our jolly little trade, right? Oh, uh, and I wouldn't jump if I were you, Peter. You have no idea how a fall like that can reduce the trade-in value of your soul. <laughs> Mina! Spencer told me you were coming here. Peter, you mustn't. I love you. You love a man without a shadow. Oh, Peter. Oh, I can have a shadow easily enough. 
All I have to do is rattle this purse and he'll give me back my shadow. And, and what must you give him? My soul. <gasps> I'll go now, Mina. He'll never see me again. No, Peter, stay with me. How can I? Wherever we go, I shall be mocked and abused. I don't care. No. No, there's another way. Let me rattle the purse, Mina. I shall have my shadow back and we will have a good life together. And your soul? Peter, I know what to do. You mustn't ever be tempted to call him back. How deep is this chasm? It is bottomless, they say. Give me the purse. No, Mina, don't throw it. There. No one will ever rattle it again. Do you know what you've done? Do you know what this means? Yes, darling. Mina, I'll never have a shadow now. If from now on we stand very close together, Peter, my shadow can belong to both of us. There's a moral to this story, you see. Under no circumstances should you be persuaded by the devil or any other clever salesman to trade in your shadow on a newer model. The young man who played Peter in our favorite story production was Sam Edwards, and the devil came to life in the person of True Boardman. I know you'll join with me in thanking our distinguished selector, Mr. Robert Frost, for choosing the man who sold his shadow to the devil as this week's favorite story. Next week, ha-ha, next week, Coleman has a chance to act. It's a character I've always been very fond of. The bad boy of the Middle Ages, Francois Villon. I'm looking forward to playing Villon in Robert Louis Stevenson's gripping short story, Lodging for a Night. It was chosen by author Frank Sullivan as his favorite story. We hope you'll be listening. <laughs> was quite an intriguing story. <laughs> I sure hate to find myself in that position. And uh but um next we have this next one is called Federal Agent and um I it's it kind of reminds me of the FBI stories, except this one seems to um, center around one agent, but um, he sounds just like all those other. Federal agent. Federal agent. Backbone of today's crusade against crime. Scotland Yard. French Sûreté. American Bureau of Investigation, Royal Canadian Mounted Police. These men are joined in a modern crusade against crime.
of the many alleys in San Francisco's Chinatown, there is a quaint old Mandarin restaurant. This one, however, differs from the others in a peculiar respect. It's closed to ordinary street business. Invitation is by membership card only. The government has had it under surveillance for a long time under suspicion of being the headquarters of the opium traffic for the Bay and Coast region. Directly across the street, in a vacant building, the Federals sit quietly watching day and night. Oh, I wouldn't mind if I could see into that upstairs floor, but they never adjust those blinds so I can see in. Hey, there's one for you, Brady. Follow him. That Chinese in the snap rim hat? Yeah. And don't get into any jams now. And if you do... <laughs> that rookie doesn't know the meaning of the word caution. Good thing I sent him off on a dud. Oh, number one is very wise. Yeah, very wise. Indeed, we are already being followed. And by only one officer and a boy? We will treat him as a boy, then. I will leave him to the lost entrance alone. And as he follows you, I will... In turn, follow him. Yes, do not make mistakes. We part here. Wait in this doorway until we are both out of sight. The other one's gone now. Well, I'll follow this baby then. Looks like a bum bet to me. If he was guilty, he should turn around at least once in a while. Ah, there he goes into that doorway, huh? Slippery as a needle. Well, I'll just slip him myself. Yeah. dark in here. I better take it easy until my eyes get adjusted. I wonder if I should take a chance on my flashlight. Ooh. I have overcome him. Good work. Assistance with body, please. Where do we take it? You fool. You did not kill him? Not sure. Number one will be displeased if we cause a disappearance without first procuring information. Let us take him to lookout room or restaurant. Maybe not dead yet. <laughs> Thunder am I. Oh. So you decided to come too, huh? Uh, who are you? <laughs> Me, I'm Santa Claus. And I already know what you are. Now that's convenient. Oh. Who am I? You're a government flat foot, that's what. Yeah, and it don't do no good reaching for your gun. Yeah. See, it's been removed. A Chinese boy took care of that. Say, look, partner. Don't call me partner. See, I hate bull. Oh, put the gun away. I couldn't jump you if I had to. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, where am I? What do you care where you are? Plenty. I'm interested in my location at all times. So is the number one. Ah, number one, huh? I'd like to meet him. You have that pleasure now? Hmm. Oh, there you are. peek a -boo. This is no time for liberty. Well, what is the time, anyway? To you, it will be eternal, unless you comply with my very simple request. Oh, I'm sure. At your service, number one. I see we both know each other. And the same fool supplied both information? I didn't tell him nothing, honest. Silence, pig. Now, Brady, here is paper and pencil. Gee, thanks. You will suffer peculiar torture if the sheet is not filled out with interesting revelations. You mean you want to know how many men you have on your tail, where the men are, how many we suspect, and stuff like that? Exactly. Oh, well, you will have to tell me about your secrets first. The American sense of humor is very unwholesome to me. I give you exactly one hour. After that interval, I shall kill you if you have wasted your hour. Think he'll uh, kill me? Kill you? He'll do everything, including that. I suppose you've got a chamber of horrors for that purpose. If I was you, I'd get busy. He ain't playing games. Yeah. And who am I to give my life for a silly secret service? Listen, you mind lifting that blind a little bit? Well, can't you see the right? Well, not quite. Okay. How's that? Well, haven't you got a light in this room? Sure, but we don't turn it on. Even if you have to write in the dark, we don't. Anyway, you got a light now. Yeah, left. Take that left blind up, too, please. Any whim to a dying man. Yeah, how's that? Fine. Hey, it, it, it's too good. Glare's on my paper. You mind putting it down that center one a bit? Hey, don't get wise with me, wise guy. Can I help it if my eyes are bad? Now, look, punch dunk. Look. If I don't get good service to write this paper, old Chop Suey is going to be mad at you. Yeah. That's better. A little lower still. All right. Thanks. Listen, if you think that someone can see in when I get the shade at a certain angle, you're crazy. That's what these things is for. Don't be silly. Stop talking. I've got an hour to write. That ought to be time enough, huh? Better be. <laughs> Do 
In the darkening alleys of Chinatown, lights begin to twinkle on. But soon something goes wrong in the city's electrical plant. The lights along a certain Wong Key alley suddenly go out. Hello? Service department? Yes. I call again, stupid cow. This is 32 at one half Wong Key alley. We sit with only candles for light. I shall sue the company unless I have immediate service. Someone will come right away? Yes. Good. I wait with patience. Who is it? It's me. I got the copy here. Would you let him in? But, Master, the officer will see where we hide drugs. Indeed. But will he live to tell? Let him in. Yes. Gosh. Get all the opium and stop. Silence. Until you are spoken to. It will be unfortunate if the paper is there. Oh, I wrote on it. Here. It is unfortunate for you in any case, however. Dear Chop Suey, foolish beginning, Brady. How are you? I am fine, although I hate being in the presence of a rattlesnake without my gun. Very interesting, policeman. I am a man of honor. You shall die. <laughs> what else would have happened to me? A faster death. Now you shall know excruciating torture. Visitors. Looks in the shaft, Uji. Well, two men. Two men, master. Dressed in overall. Oh, the electrician. Shall I edit them now? Or have them wait until we finish with this white pig? Go to the entry and hold them there for a few moments. Ready? You are in great luck. I haven't time to personally amuse myself with your death, so you will die more suddenly. Let us see now. Taho! Jim Lee! Take this man and securely fasten him in the jade room. Then take some copper wire and bind his feet and hands in it. And electrocution? Yes. Oh, now listen, number one. Can I go along on that job? They might not drown him, and if they don't, he'll only get 110 instead of 220 volts. Sure. Let him help. Chop to a old stick. Indeed, Brady, it is a good idea. I admire your courage, but you are a fool. You're a fool to mess around with my death. I think not. Can you enjoy a bit of whimsy? A little joke? Yeah, shoot. The electricians are coming to repair the lights. But is it not amusing to know that you will be electrocuted in the same repair that gives me light? Take the wretch away. You won't get away with this chop, Suey. You. Tell Wuji to admit electricians now. Hurry, pigs. Get that last case out of here. And lock yourself in the basement with it. Make no sound. He's electric? Yeah, he is electric. What's the matter? Did you try to jip the city out of a few ampere hours? No, sir. No jip sitter. Lights go out in humble restaurant. You fix it, Harry? Yeah, sure, sure. We'll fix it in a hurry. Come on. Come on with them tools, Jack. Okay. Uh, you better set them down here, I guess. And we'll start tracing the conduit here. Do I hear noises on the roof? Yeah. Yeah, we got a line crew up on the top of the building. I guess the whole joint must have burned out at once. Yeah, the whole district went to fluid. Is it customary for linemen to have such nice fingernails? Stand where you are, both of you. You are covered by my very excellent automatic. Oh. How do you like this very excellent Stilson wrench in the jaw? Huh? Good work. <laughs> I thought Wooji quiet for a while, too. Now, let him in, Jack. And shoot anybody that blocks your way to the door. Oh, Brady. Brady. Brady, where are you? Brady! Oh! Ah, Turn the joint inside out, boys. Brady's still alive. Hey, hey, don't shoot, boss. Don't shoot. I ain't done nothing. I see. Hey, thank heavens. All right, boys. Take that gorilla down to the main room. 
The rest of the boys ought to have quite a crowd down there by now. Say, listen, Brady. How in thunder did you expect anyone to read those wigwag signals with the blinds? You seem to have understood them all right. Listen for our next presentation of thrilling stories related to this modern crusade as each nation calls upon its chief bulwark against crime. Federal agent. For my snack today, or my Sunday, I'm going to have a bowl of butter pecan ice cream. Imaginary. I hope yours is real. Um, it's funny, I don't like pecans, but it made me think of my aunt. Now, I love the taste of butter pecan ice cream. I just don't like pecans. And so, whatever I was eating... Um, I would pick the pecans out of it, and I would put them over on her plate, (laughs) and she would eat them. Boy, I miss her. But um, that's pretty much what it is, is just the butter pecan ice cream. And before I go today, I'll be putting the strawberry and whipped cream on it, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Somebody had requested the Green Hornet, and... I uh, was able to go up there and get one today, but I'm having some trouble with the uh, website that I usually go to. It doesn't seem as accessible as it used to be um, because I always have a very difficult time finding the download links anymore on it. And I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. I guess I'm going to have to go back and look at the FAQs and see what's going on. But um, I got... Um, I got one today, and um, I will get more because there's more places than just one, but I think I'll get this one figured out. Um, but um, anyway, the Green Hornet one that I have is called the Child Labor Racket. The Green Hornet. <laughs> He hunts the biggest of all game, public enemies that even the G-men cannot reach, the Green Hornet. Thank <laughs> you. 
his faithful valet Cato, Britt Reed, daring young publisher, matches wits with the underworld, risking his life that criminals and racketeers within the law may feel its weight by the sting of the Green Hornet. Ride with Britt Reed as he races toward another thrilling adventure. The Green Hornet strikes again. Hurry, Cato. Here's where we smash a child labor racket. Case, Baylor. Oh, thank you, Judge. Thank you. My boy, he only did it because Just I... Just see that it doesn't happen again, Mrs. Curry. If it does, I won't dismiss it in night court. I'll have to remand your boy for juvenile court. All right, that's all. Can we go now, Ma? Yes, this way. Who's next here? What's the charge, Baylor? All right, step up here, young man. No. Gosh, Ma, did we do something wrong? It's all right, Tommy. We'll go home. But next time, you've got to be more careful when you tell the <laughs> Oh, oh. Gee, I'm awful tired. What do I have to sell handkerchiefs for, Ma? For money, Tommy. We gotta eat. I'll get left back in school if I don't do more homework. You get some sleep now. As soon as we get home, I we'll... fell asleep in class yesterday. Everybody laughed at me. Uh, I only sold four handkerchiefs, Ma. It was sort of cold standing outside the big store. Only four. You'll sell more tomorrow night, Tommy. I wish we had lots of money so that I didn't have to sell nothing. <laughs> Wish the name heaven, honey. Hey, just a minute. Hey, hurry, Tommy. Now, wait a minute, lady. All right, we got to get home. Hello, mister. Hello, son. How's the handkerchief business? Gosh, if everybody bought them like you, gosh, we'd be rich. Please, Tommy has to get home to bed. Now, take it easy. I'm a reporter, that's all, not a cop. We, we got nothing to say. Oh, gee, Mom, he's okay. He's the man who took the four handkerchiefs I sold. I told wait you about... past your bedtime, Tommy. Open the door. Oh, Mom, you said you were tired. Now, we can't wait to talk oh, to you. Just wait. a second. I happen to know Curry isn't your real name. We can't. What? I thought that would stop you. What kind of a racket are you pulling? I... Why, it's... Uh... Listen, Tommy. Yeah, mister? Uh, see that newsboy down the block a ways? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Here's two bits. Get me a paper, huh? Gosh, sure I will. Uh, get a daily sentinel and keep the chain. Oh, golly, gosh. Thanks. Yeah. No sense having the kid around, Mrs. Curry, or whatever your name is. I... I had to use the name... Otherwise, the judge... Listen, is... lady, you can't tell me a thing about judges or magistrates or how they act. I've been covering night court since I was a cub reporter. Here. This is one of the handkerchiefs your kid sold me, isn't it? Please. You don't understand. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Sending that kid out at night to sell handkerchiefs. I... We need the money. I make them myself to sell so that we can... Sounds like a good two minutes of story. Two minutes? You mean in, in the paper? Yeah, sure. The Daily Sentinel. Oh, please, you must. Give me a reason. Well, I... We need the money. Tommy's my boy. I take good care of him, but he needs food. Sure, I can see you love the kid, but what's behind it? I... I don't know what to mean. Your kid isn't the only one. I've noticed at least 50 others. Some of them even younger than Tommy. All selling handkerchiefs. And all those handkerchiefs are the same. I... Well, I... We get them from a manufacturer. A lot of us, Mother. We hand-roll the edges and tell them. Besides, how do you know enough to give a fake name in front of the magistrate? Please. My Tommy has to get some sleep. It's late. Last time you were up on the same charge, you gave the name Mulhouse. Is that the real name? Please, I... Lucky thing for you, a different magistrate was sitting, so you weren't recognized this time. Stop, stop. We, we tried so hard to make both ends meet. I didn't want Tommy to do this. I didn't know what we were getting into. I... Getting into? What? What were you getting into? Oh, can't you leave it alone? Please, please. Well, it isn't fair to those kids. What do they get out of life? Food? I can't tell you anything. You mean you won't? It doesn't matter. I sir, here's your paper. Huh? Oh, oh, thanks, honey. Tommy, say goodnight to the man. We're going. Mrs. Mulhouse, I'm trying to help you. Ma, that man in the car is waiting for us. Car? Yep, right down there. He says he's going to take us home. See the one blowing his horn. Oh. Oh, oh yes, her. He's got the door open. Golly, ain't that a swell car? Hey, hold on. No, it's late. Let's go. We're coming. Wait a minute. Hey, you. You. Hey, taxi. Taxi. 
It's got to be. Hold your horses, Larry. You're not on a soapbox. What was that dame doing in a big car like that in the first place? And that little kid you had with Okay, him. you saw her get in. What'd you do? Stand there with your mouth open? Can I help it if I got a cab? You couldn't go faster than 20 miles an hour. You're going to run faster than that. Yeah, I wish I had. Uh, probably a rich uncle. Let's wait. Uncle my foot. I tell you, some kind of a racket. Okay, okay. But it can't compete for the one you're making. Oh, don't trust me, huh? Listen, you hear those phones ringing? See that clock? Hear those copy boys? Those teletypes? Blasted Lowry, this is a newspaper office. I'm an editor. There's a favor to get out. So what? So pet your pipe dream someplace else. I'm busy. Johnny, if this isn't a racket, I'm a Chinaman. Okay, you're a Chinaman. And Confucius say that's your cue to cram. And I'm not gagging. Ha ha. Very funny. Very funny. Johnny, I think Lowry may have something in what he said. Mm-hmm. I can hear you two going and start across the study room. Boss, it was last night. A night quarter. I tried to talk to this dame about her kid, and she... She said nothing. Eh? Not a peep. And she gets in this big car. What's the tire? Yeah, I heard all that while you were yelling it at Gunnigan. This guy's got rackets on the brain, Reed. Why not, Gunnigan? Rackets are news. Sure, when they're rackets. Exactly. Huh? Hey, boss, you think maybe... Reed. You mean, there is something to this? I do, definitely. Those kids aren't selling handkerchiefs because they like it. There must be at least 50 of them out peddling. I counted them standing outside the big department store. And these kids' parents, what about them? That's what gets me, boss. They don't appear like any kind of racketeers to me. Oh, sure, some of them might use their kids to sell on the street if they need money real bad, but but all of them sell them the same thing. What's the angle, Reed? Well, it looks to me like an attempt to put child labor on an organized base. Organized? Yeah. Someone behind it. Someone big. Yeah, and I'll bet that guy in the car has... Right. A... The woman wouldn't talk, which... No. Does that look like her own idea, Larry? Well, uh... All right. News desk. Gunnigan, yeah. Uh, just a second. Who is it? Some guy at the Motor Vehicle Bureau wants to talk to you, Larry. Huh? Me? Yeah, Jimmy. Hello? Yeah, Larry talking. You got it? Okay, okay, let's have it. Who owns that car? I... Huh? You sure? Okay, thanks. What's it about, Larry? Boss, I checked with a friend of mine. Do you know who was driving that car? The one that took the woman and hid away from night court last night? You said you lost that car while you were... Yeah, I lost it, but I had sense enough to get the license number before it got out of sight. Well, let's have it. It belongs to a small-time crook named Grafton. Grafton? Yeah, and I'm going to ask that mug some questions. Hold it, Larry. Of course. If I hurry, maybe we can make sure you... You're not going alone. Huh? Gunning can call headquarters. Get Sergeant Moran in on this. Right. Oh, boss. Do I have to drag the law along? You go with Moran, Larry. Governor works with the police all the time. Don't worry. If there's a scoop, he won't give it away. I don't think there will be. Why not? This guy must be... He's a small-time crook, isn't he? Yes, but... If you ask me, he's too small. There's someone behind him. Okay, Larry. I gave Moran the dope. He'll be waiting for your police headquarters. That's all I'm waiting for. I'll give you a lift, Larry. I'm on my way home. I'll drop you off. And, Larry, if you get something, hold it in fast. I can't keep page one open forever. Greenhorn of mask and the weapon. No time to win the details now, Cato. I dropped Lowry off at police headquarters. He and Sergeant Moran are on their way now to see a man named Grafton. Who is he? Well, he's involved in some sort of a child labor racket. Lowry got the dope on it last night. Just a tip, but enough to give him a start. Then why do we... Oh, we go out? Because, Cato, this man Grafton's only a small-time crook, a petty thief. And certain Lowry and Moran will get a thing out of him. And that's where the Green Hornet comes in. Green Hornet? You get the mask and the gun and meet me in the hiding place of the Black Beauty. Hurry. Very well, Mr. Witt. opened a secret panel behind this clothes press. It concealed a narrow passage built within the wall of the apartment house, which connected directly with an adjoining building. Suppose they abandoned this building was in reality the hiding place of the sleek, super-powered black beauty, car of the Green Hornet. Come on, Cato, I'm waiting. 
Get the last one done. Very good. The gun's loaded. Yes, sir. I've checked the black beauty. It's in perfect condition. Now get behind the wheel. You'll do the driving. Very well. Ah. Lowry and Moran are halfway to Grafton's place already. Here's the address. You think the black beauty can get us there ahead of them? We'd try. Okay, make it fast. Step on it. <laughs> Okay, just a second. I'll press the button and let you in. I'll be coming up in a minute. Might as well put on the lights. What's that? Sounded like the back door opener. Who's there? <laughs> I could swear there's somebody in there. Never mind the lights, Grafton. I'll put them on myself. Who are you? Where'd you come from? Fire escape and back. What's the idea? Mask. Get the green horn. There's no time for talk. You're getting out of here. Huh? Don't stand there like a fool. Come on. You, you've got a gun. I don't need a gun for you. Come on, we're beating it. I don't get it. Take a look out that window. The window? What are you... Look, snap it up. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll... Hey, it's a police car. A squad car. Right. They're coming up now. Cops coming up here? You mean the guy who rang the downstairs bell? I'm going to ask you questions, and the boss says you to beat it. The boss sent you? He doesn't want you around to give the cops too many answers. Listen, I won't. They might talk. make you talk. But remember, you were in that car last night. You were seen. Huh? With a woman and the kid. Yeah, that's right. That nosy reporter. Exactly. Now, hurry. We can go out the way I came with a pirate tape. Well, I... Fire. That's the police. Go ahead. Ask who it is. Who, who is it? Who boss, Jackson? You're going to ask a couple of questions. Yeah, you're right. Just a talk. Listen, Hornet, where are we going to scram? Tell him we'll be right there. Hurry. Just a second. Come on this way with me. We'll get on the fire escape. Yeah, yeah. You're the right guy, Hornet. Hey, Captain. Hey, Captain. You don't have to worry. Come on, break it down. Come on. Captain. Hey, Moran, there's no one here. He went this way, out the back. Yeah, down that fire escape. Who tipped him off? Holy right? mackerel, Moran. Look at this. He's lying here right beside the fire escape. Huh? Gangway, let me get the phone. Wait till Gunnigan hears about this. What are you talking about? This just tapped this seal. It's the mark of the Green Hornet. Come on, come on, stop the car. That's better. Now get out. Listen, Harlan. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, what's on your mind, Grafton? This whole setup, there's something phony about it. If Fletcher wanted me out of the way when a cop showed, he's got my phone number. Why'd he call me? Fletcher does things his own way. Sure, he's the boss. I had you pulled a fool stunt last night. Oh, listen, how was I to know that guy with him was a reporter? You should have checked. Okay, okay, so I pulled a bone. You're dead. That's how the police knew where to locate you. They checked your license number. How about the bone of you pulled? I Now take it easy. I don't mean nothing. Only you heard the radio in my car while we was driving out here. You left the hornet seal in my place, the cops spotted it. 
That happens to be my affair. It's too much that's your affair, Hornet. Fletcher never told me he was in with the Hornet in this racket. Rathen, you stick to your job, and that's all. And a chump like you can handle the small stuff. Small stuff? Say, listen, who's the guy that lines up them things with kids to peddle the stuff that Fletcher feels? I suppose you call that hard. Yeah, then when they find out they're peddling stolen goods, I gotta keep them in line, don't I? Go ahead. Sure I will. Me? Small stuff? <laughs> Why, if it wasn't that I scare them dames to death, they might squawk when they learn they're handling hot goods. So Fletcher steals it and you farm it out. Eh? Yeah, and I collect the dough from the dames, too. Why, if it wasn't for me... Thanks, Drafton, you've talked plenty. And I'll talk a lot more. I don't think so. Hey, those are my keys. You won't need them. What the... You've gone bats throwing my keys into the woods. How am I going to find them? I'm leaving now, Drafton. Yeah, how? We come in my car. How are we going to drive it without the keys? I said I'm leaving. What? Not you. What are you talking about? Just this. You've done too much talking. Wait a minute. If you shoot your mouth off to me, you might talk to anybody. But you're the heart. I was afraid of your tongue. Oil too well. He gave me instructions. That? That's my car, Grafton. I came with you, but I'm leaving your hair. Wait a minute. Now, Dan still. Put that gun down, Hornet. You Listen. won't talk anymore, Grafton. You can't pull a rod on me. I'll drop that gun or I'll drop you. Come on, come on. Try to plug me and I'll blast you full of holes like... Ooh. 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 You. My arm. Your arm's paralyzed, Grafton. What happened? Can't pull the trigger. Take it. No. Don't you. Don't. Oh. Oh. God. I can't breathe. Oh. Take a look at him. Yes, sir. He's unconscious. Good. You almost had the drop on me there, kiddo. Lucky thing you left the black beauty and came around behind him. I used the jury, sir. How long will I just keep him unconscious, kiddo? Oh, one hour, maybe. One hour. Here, drop these keys beside him where he can find them when he comes to. He has the keys to his car. He thought I threw them away. And it's dark. It was a simple matter to go through the motions without throwing them. So well, let's go. We're heading back to town on the Black Beauty. When this rap recovers, the fireworks will start. And they'll be parting right at Fletcher. <laughs> Get here. How? The Hornet. I remember. Try to bump me off, huh? I'll fix this wagon. I ain't hurt. Not a... What's that? Hey. The keys. The keys to the car. Now I can get someplace. Head back to town and... Yeah. There's a farmhouse back away. Spotted it when he was driving out here. I'll call the cops and give him an airfall. I'll tell him what's going on and how to get... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe I'm jumping the gun. Maybe the Hornet ain't working for Fletcher like I figured. Maybe he's trying to put Fletcher on the spot so he can take over the racket himself. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's it. What am I going to do? If I go to Fletcher and he is with the Hornet, this time they'll get me. How am I going to find out what I'm sticking my neck out at? I got it. I'll call him on the phone from that farmhouse. That's it. Then I can find out. And I can still spill with the cops if I have to. Either way, I'll fix that hornet right. Hello? Who's this, Fletcher? Yes, who's talking? This is Trent. I'm out of town in a farmhouse. What do you know about the hornet? Captain, be careful. Someone may be listening. Never mind that. I got a gun to take care of these yokels. The hornet tried to bump me off. Yes, uh, yes, I know. What? I, uh, I know about the hornet, but, uh, but you're, you're still alive, Captain. What's the matter? You sound nervous. Nervous? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I'm not nervous. I, I was just worried about you and the hornet. Well, you know it all about time, huh? I, uh, I, uh, listen, Captain, I... I can't talk now. You try to bump me off, huh? Well, Grafton, listen, I know about it, but I, I didn't tell the Hornet to bump you off. I, uh, 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 that is, yes, yes, the, the Hornet works for me. That's what I thought. Uh, Grafton, wait. I'll fix you, you dumb truck and rat. I'll tell the police about the whole racket. I'll try to take evidence. Uh, Grafton, don't, don't, don't tell the police. Listen, the Hornet. That's for you and the Hornet both. Grafton. 
Captain. We Captain. You can hang up now, Fletcher. He's gone. I said he... hang up. Look, Hornager. You've had that gun in my ribs ever since I phone right. Exactly. So you telegraphed what I wanted you to say. But I he thinks you and I it worries you? Captain figures I I give the order to have him bumped. That's your headache. But he, he he's gonna spill. He, he's gonna tell the police. Stop squirming, you rat. Hold it, I I'm on the spot. I got a warehouse full of stolen goods. Stuff I've been fishing out through the through the racket. I know all about that. Grafton did plenty of talking. If the police ever find out I'm, I'm so ruined. Where is this warehouse you use? On the other side of the town. Look, Hornet. I don't know what your game is. Maybe you're trying to muffle your way in, but, but what can I do? Is the warehouse inflammable? Huh? Will it burn if you set fire to it? Yeah. yeah. That's the only way. Let it burn. I'll collect the insurance. And the stolen goods will go up in flames. What do you say, Hornet? I'll give you a split of the racket. I get plenty from these women. I don't doubt it. You steal the stuff to a cost you nothing. You take back most of what they collect to the kids. Fletcher, did you ever hear of child labor? Oh, quit feeding me that stuff. I'll make it worth your while, Hornet. Name it. How about ten grand? Chicken feed. Fifteen. That's all I got in the safe. Fifteen thousand, eh? Hurry. Captain's probably shooting his mouth off to the police right now. They'll have a squad car over there fast. If I'm going to set it on fire, I gotta get going. Okay, Fletcher. Get the 15000 out of your safe. It's a deal. Oh, nothing yet. Yeah, we're keeping a special alarm out, Commissioner. Okay. Hey, Lowry. I tell you, there isn't any news, Conigan. That's all there is. Well, get the news, Lowry. It's the Green Hornet. There's been no trace of the hornet since Moran and me went over to Crafton's place. And where's Crafton? Oh, and gone, disappeared. For Pete's sake, Gunnigan. I'm doing the best place. I want that alibi, Lowry. I want you. You. Hold it, Gunnigan. Gunnigan again, Lowry. On my neck like a stiff collar. Why don't you cops get me some news? Cause there ain't none, I tell oh, you. Oh, there's your phone answer. Maybe you'll get something. Now, Gunnigan. Steve, listen, will you? I'm not hooting. I can't work. Please, headquarters. Dr. Moran talking. If you want to find a warehouse full of stolen goods, go to 480 West 6th Street. Stolen goods? Who's talking? I'm in a farmhouse out on Route 7. A farmer named Brown. I'm on a train to take seven. Who is this? The name's Grafton. The Green Hornet tried to bump me off. I'm coming in to give myself up. Hey there, Grafton. We'll have the state police there before you hang up the phone. You'll get all the dope on the racket Fletcher is running. Fletcher? Is he behind it? Him and the green hornet. Go to 480. I got it. We'll cover it. You wait right where you are. Hey, Lowry. Lowry, come on. We got a tip. Huh? Come on, Johnny. I'll call you later. What's up, Sergeant? Grafton, turn and stay seven. It's a racket, all right, and the guy behind it is Fletcher. Fletcher? Yeah, him and the hornet. If you come along, start moving. There's a warehouse full of stolen goods. I want to take a good look at it. You and me both, Moran. Lead the way. The sentinel's ready to print whatever you find. <laughs> Handed me fifteen thousand, Fletcher. I thought I'd better come along. Here, put the fire right beside this door. And this wants that glass to set the whole works blazing. It didn't bother, Fletcher. What? Did that fire? It's the police. The, the police? They're, they're coming here. I, I, I've got to get out. I, I got to be here. You're not going anyplace, Fletcher. Grab them! What the talk? The police are here. You're staying here, Fletcher. Wait, oh, are you let go! I'm gonna... You're getting the right to the dark. I'm going, Fletcher. The Green Hornet has one more call to make. Give our regards to the police. No, got to get out. My God. Hey, Moran, who's that? Hey, you're trying to set a fire. Hey, he got him. And kill your racket. It, it, it was the Hornet. The Hornet. I'm back in fire. We got a tip about you, Fletcher. You're heading to the cooler. Grabs him, told you. Get him and grabs him. He and the Hornet. They hey, don't walk up, Fletcher. Got a warehouse full of stolen stuff, huh? Why don't you get the Hornet? Never mind the Hornet. 
Okay. The hornet gave us a trick like he always does. But we still have one bird. You tell him, Moran, the bird in the hand is worth a headline any day. And this one's a jailbird. <laughs> long ago, and, and Mom and me, we ain't had no money for a new one. I see. You won't have to peddle any more handkerchiefs, Tommy. Please, I won't. But Mom says And your that... mother doesn't have to worry about that man anymore. The one who made threats to us. I guess you mean Grafton, huh? He's in jail, Tommy. They're all in jail. Here, take this and give it to your mother. Sure I will. What is it? Money, Tommy. Money. And I've got some more for the other kids who are peddling handkerchiefs. They'll be all right. Gee, Willikins, mister. This feels like a lot of money. An awful lot of money. And it's all for me and Mama? Good night, Tommy. Tommy, there were you. You were talking. Look, Mom. Look. There was a man here in the dark. He says we don't have to worry none no more. He gave me money. He said Grafton's going to jail. I wish he was. I never knew her getting mixed up in a wreck. But it's true, Mom. It's true. Tommy, you've been dreaming. There's no one here. Oh, I was not. The you man was dreaming, Tommy. Dreaming. But, Mom, look. Here's the money. Here's the money. Now, Tommy, you know that. What? What? It is money. It is. Oh, Tommy. Gosh, Mom, what are you crying for? Everything's all right now, ain't it? Everything's all right now. Everything's all right. Everything's all right. <laughs> for you a little chiller and thriller um, called The Hermit's Cave and I love The Hermit's Cave because he has just such a wicked sound and um, and for those of you not familiar with The Hermit's Cave you know it's about this old man that lives off in a cave by himself and he he comes out once in a while to tell a story and this one that he's doing today is called It Happened Sunday. And uh, I'd sure hate to be in this man's shoes. <laughs> but I'll let you listen for yourself. In the little theater of the air. Now, it's time for the hermit. on Sunday? Eh? Then listen while the hermit tells you the story. <laughs> yes? Yeah? 
your cousin, Viola Strait, is here to see you, Mr. Strait. Viola, swell. Send her right in. Yes, Mr. Strait. It's a coincidence. Just about to call her. Hello, Vi. Hello, dear. Here, take this chair. Most comfortable one in the office. You know, I was just saying to myself, this is a coincidence. I was just going to call you. Were you? Yes. Raymond just called me about 20 minutes ago. He did? Yeah. This is more of a coincidence than you thought, because I came up to talk about Ray. Well, what do you know about that? I just had to talk with someone. And of course, Dave, you were the logical person. He's your closest friend. You introduced us a year ago. Which should give me the right to be best man at your wedding, don't you think? If there is any wedding. Hmm? Oh, Dave, there's something terribly wrong with Raymond these last three weeks. He isn't the same person. Why, haven't I told you before? When he gets one of these painting streaks of his, he isn't like other people. He always goes out to his studio cottage and refuses to see any of his friends. I know those moods, but this is different. In what way? I don't know where to begin to tell you. I've been so upset. It's so... so baffling. It all started three weeks ago. Monday night, Ray and I were having dinner at Meadow Lane Inn. You know that place, about four miles from his cottage? Oh, sure. Well, we'd driven out to the cottage in the afternoon. Ray was going to pick up some canvases he had out there. The housekeeper... Mrs. Orion, you mean? Yes. Well, she and her husband hadn't expected Ray to call that day, and they were house cleaning. Mm Mm-hmm. So I didn't go into the living room. I stood in the hallway, and I heard Ray tell Mrs. Orion to burn that big oil painting he made of his wife just a few months before she died. You heard him tell her to burn it? Yes. He said it upset him so every time he came out and looked at it. He didn't mention it when we got in the car and drove to the inn. Then, while we were eating, he scarcely spoke to me. So while we were having our coffee, I decided to break the fire. I overheard what you said to your housekeeper while we were at the cottage. I wasn't supposed to, I know. What are you referring to, Vi? About burning that lovely painting. Oh, I, I see. You weren't going to do it because of me. Because you thought it might annoy me? No. Then why destroy it, Ray? I think it's best. Miriam belongs to a dead past. You can't kill memory. No, that's true. Ray, I don't know how to say this exactly, but perhaps you shouldn't marry me in August. Maybe you aren't ready to marry anyone yet. After all, it'll only be three years this month. I know how much you mourned, how much you loved her. Bye. Let's not talk about it anymore. Our plans are all made. Believe me, it's best for you to forget all that you heard me say to Mrs. Orion. Please, let's not mention it again. Naturally, I said nothing more. But from that night, Raymond seemed to change. Evenings when we've gone out, he's silent, almost morose. He doesn't seem to be aware that I'm in his presence. Then, Monday of this week, he called to say he was going out to the cottage but he didn't say when he would see me again. He didn't invite me to drive out there. It was almost as if he was saying goodbye for good. Hmm, that's strange. You say he just called you? Yes. Did he have anything to say about, well, about him and me? No, he didn't, Vi. But he was very upset. He asked me how busy I was, and then he said, Dave, you've got to come out here no matter how busy you are. I want you to come out and stay the rest of the week. What can be the matter? I don't know. Isn't like Ray, I'll admit. Are you going out? Uh Uh-huh. Tomorrow. Told him I had some work that I couldn't leave until tomorrow afternoon. Oh. I'll tell you what. Tomorrow's Friday. You can drive out Saturday afternoon. Oh, but Dave, if he doesn't want me to be... Oh, nonsense. You come out. I won't tell him. We'll rig up a surprise party. Whatever is eating him, you'll get it off his chest Friday night. By the time you get there, he'll be straightened around. I hope so. Will you come? Yes, if you think it's all right. I don't have to tell you how much I think of Ray. I'll do anything to help him. And although it would break my heart if he's decided it's best for him not to marry me, I'll respect his wishes. Forget that angle. He loved Marion very much, didn't he? None of us saw anything of her or Ray while she lived, but I suppose he did. You know it. He never left her side. He allowed her to stay in the cottage while he painted. They were inseparable companions for seven years. You can't forget anything like that in three. No. Why did I have to meet him? Why did I have to fall in love with him? Why you're creating unnecessary mountains. Now, I don't know what's wrong, but I know it isn't anything to fret about. So stop worrying and come out Saturday afternoon ready to have a good time. You'll see. Everything will be straightened out. Well, Mrs. Orion, it's nice to see you again. 
I'm glad to see you, Mr. Street. Now, where is this guy who dragged me away from a busy office on Friday afternoon? Hmm? He's up in the studio. He said to tell you when you came to come right up there. Fine. I thought when he called me yesterday that he might be ill. No, oh, no, Mr. Street. It's not any physical illness he's got. It's something mental. Sir, well, just exactly what do you mean? I, I can't say any more. I shouldn't have said what I have. But if you're his friend, Mr. Street, you'll urge him to get away from the cottage this weekend. Well, how... Now, please don't ask me any questions, Mr. Street. I can't say another thing. And don't mention to him what I have said. No, no, of course not. Just remember... Mr. Putman isn't himself, not at all. And he needs you. He needs your help and friendship. He has both, Mrs. Orion. You know how I feel about him. At times, it seems like he's my son. I've taken care of him ever since his parents died all these years since. I know how you feel. And yet, I'm just his housekeeper. I have to remember that. Now, uh, shall I take you up to the studio? No, thanks. I'll burst in and surprise him. See you later, Mrs. Orion. Believe me, I'm looking forward to one of your good dinners. Come in. How are you, Ray? Hello, Dave. I'm glad you came. Gosh, I thought from the urgency of your invitation that you wanted me to come out and pose for a painting. <laughs> I've often wondered why you never saw anything worthwhile in this mug of mine. <laughs> Yeah, what's wrong, Ray? Just no go? There's nothing wrong. I invited you down because you haven't visited me for a long time. That's all. Okay, Ray. Been doing some work? No. It's a doggone shame that you came into so much money you don't have to paint for a livelihood. You've done some mighty fine things. Now, listen, you can't walk the floor this way and still insist there's nothing wrong. Well, why keep it all to yourself? Why not get it off your chest? You invited me down here for a purpose. Look, we've been friends for years. I'm the logical person for you to confide in. Now, come on, stop walking this room like a lion in a cage. Listen to me. Is it Vi? Have you found you don't care for her? No. Is it something about your health? No. Well, then, it can't be anything very serious. If you're my friend, don't ask me any more questions. If you want to know why I invited you down here, it's because I don't want to be alone. I want you here. Your wish is granted. Now, what do you say we have a stroll around the grounds and then urge Mrs. Orion to serve dinner early, hmm? Come start. Dave, we can't leave the studio. You've got to eat here with me. We'll sleep here tonight. You see, I've had Mrs. Orion bring two cots in here. You've got to stay right here in this room with me. Hmm? Now, wait. Don't ask me why. Just give in to this whim of mine, or whatever you want to call it. You have me baffled, I'll admit. Maybe someday I can explain. If I ever do, then remember this episode is between you and me. Never to be mentioned to anyone else. Now, let's settle down. <laughs> I'll roll up in my bunk, Ray. You ought to do the same. Go ahead if you're sleeping. I am. Wish I could persuade you to have a game of golf with me in the morning. I will in a few days. Well, what's wrong with tomorrow? You heard what I said. I'm not leaving the studio until Sunday morning. So that's that. Well, I'll be talking to you in the morning. It's a doggone shame to sleep on an old cot like this when this house is filled with good beds. You're turned out to be a heck of a host. Well, good night. Good night. laughing as if they were right outside the windows of the studio. No one can get in these windows. They're all locked. Hey, what is this? As if anyone would put up a fireman's ladder to try to climb in this third floor studio. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, I hope you do. Maybe you're expecting someone to drop in through the skylight. 
Listen. Did you hear it? Oh, sure. Someone at the door. Well, get on my robe before you let them in. Oh, no one here. You heard the knocking on the door, but you see there's no one here. Mrs. Orion was right. What she told me is true. She came back last year at the same time and the year before. She won't rest in her grave. Mrs. Orion was right. She does come back. Be cleared up once and for all. Here, Mrs. Orion, you sit here in this chair. Thank you, Mr. Street. Pete, supposing you sit here. Sure. Hate to get you two good folks out of your beds at one o'clock in the morning, but I want this crazy business cleared up. My wife and I don't mind, Mr. Street. Oh, we don't mind at all. Anything we can do to help Mr. Putnam. There's nothing anyone can do. I want the whole of this story. Now, Mrs. Orion. Ray tells me that for the past two years since Miriam died, that you people think she has walked about in this house each year on the eve of the night she died. Oh, yes, Mr. Strait. Pete and I heard the walking up in the studio. We heard something, all right. Got up to investigate, but we didn't see anybody. Of course you didn't. You know that there's no possibility of such a thing being true. Mrs. Orion, just this afternoon you told me how much you thought of Ray. Well, if that's so, why in thunder would you tell him such yarns? He made me tell him. I didn't want to. I tried to convince myself there wasn't anything to it. But we did hear her walking up in the studio, and we heard her laughing just like she used to do. Mr. Putnam, he made me listen on the night last year and the year before and report to him. Ray, what made you think Miriam's spirit would come back to haunt this house? Because she said she would just before she died. Well, of all that... Now, come on. Suppose you tell me the whole of this wild tale, hmm? You might as well know it all, Mrs. Orion. Well, that's what I say. I was a coward. I stayed away from the cottage last year and the year before at this time. These days are the anniversary of her death. I was afraid of a threat. I... Well, go on, Ray. No one but Pete and Mrs. Orion knew what Marion was like. She was insane, Dave. But I never let anyone know it. I never let her out of my sight. What I'm saying is true, isn't it, Mrs. Orion? Oh, the poor boy put up with more than anyone will ever know. She used to stand here in the studio when I'd be painting and laugh, just as she did tonight. Creep up behind me as I work. At these. <laughs> what? <laughs> Miriam, you frighten me. Sure. You're always afraid of me. Afraid that I will kill you. Miriam, where'd you get that knife? Out of the kitchen. Mrs. Orion never saw me take it. <laughs> Give it to me, Mary. I'm going to kill you with it. Just like I'm going to slash your picture to threads right now. Miriam, don't. Miriam, wait. <laughs> Your horrible old pictures. No one wants to buy them. None of them are any good. <laughs> None of them are any good. Why don't you paint me? You paint everything and everybody but me. You don't paint me because you want to spite me. I know it. I had intended to paint her for a long time. I tried to. But she wouldn't sit for me. And when she did, it was always to annoy me. She'd sit and grimace, laugh. I should have put her in an institution, but I couldn't bear the thought of that. She was beautiful, frail. I was afraid of the treatment they might give her. So I kept her near me all the time. Mrs. Orion and Pete were frightened, but they stayed on for my sake. Finally, I decided to paint Miriam, even though she wouldn't sit for me. This seemed to mollify her somewhat. Oh, she was much easier to handle those last few months. Almost friendly-like. That was because she was growing weaker, though we didn't know it. You see, I had never called in a doctor for fear he would judge her insane. And then that last night, as Mrs. Orion and I stood by her bed, she raised up, looked at me wildly. I'll come back every year at the same time. Do you understand what I say? I'll come back every year until I have my revenge. We 
We heard what she said, Mr. Strait. But I told Mr. Putnam not to worry over it, none. She was always saying crazy things. I did forget it for a little time after she was gone. But two years ago, and then last year, as the time of the anniversary of her death drew near, her threat bothered me. I wouldn't come near the studio. Pete and Mrs. Orion watched for me. They heard her. And then this year, I realized that I couldn't marry Vi until I was sure in my own mind. Until I'd stayed here myself. And then tonight, tonight I did hear her laugh. It was as distinct as if she were alive. So there's only one thing to do. Tomorrow at midnight, if I hear a knock at this door, even though I see no one, I'll use my revolver. I'll fire at her unseen spirit standing at the door of this studio. sandwiches and coffee, Rain. Want to join me in a snack? No. Well, I'm going to have coffee or I may fall asleep on you. Stays piping hot in this thermos jug. Good cup of coffee is just what you need. No, nothing. Uh, you know, it's a strange thing to me how you can be taken in by all this nonsense. You aren't going to hear anything tonight or any night. You forget that I did last night. Oh, you listened so hard last night you had to hear anything your mind created. Didn't you hear someone knock? You had me believing almost anything. I feel so darn silly. As if we were playing a game of cops and robbers. You sitting here with that gun. Both of us waiting for a spirit to make an appearance. Yeah, I was planning on having a swell weekend. I told Vi to come out today, but with things as they are, I decided it was best to call her and tell her not to come. Better have some of this coffee. Dave. Yeah. Look at that rocking chair. The one Miriam always sat in. It's moving. See it? Rocking back and forth. Oh, what's funny about that? I've seen chairs rock by themselves lots of times. Uh, uh, wind catches them. Miriam sitting in that chair. I see her. She's sitting in the rocker. Oh, get a hold of yourself. There isn't anyone there. <laughs> Stop that laughing. <laughs> I'll end that insane laughter of yours forever. <laughs> Wait. You're the one who's insane. There's no one sitting in that chair. Oh, you frightened the wits out of the Orient. Coming up the stairs. <laughs> Coming, I'll let you in. Get away from me. You can't touch me. Why, it's all his imagination. The fire of the rocker. I thought she was sitting in it. Mr. Putnam, what's the matter? What's wrong? She's got her hands around my throat. There ain't anyone in here but us, Mr. Putnam. Her hands around my throat. Stop. Stop. I'll confess. I poisoned you. I had to kill you. But... You might have harmed innocent people. It was best to kill you. Or that. Oh, stop. Mr. Strait, Let do me something breathe. Uh, Ray, Ray, there's no one in this room. Miriam didn't return. Ray. What's the matter with him? Call a doctor, Mrs. Orm. I'm afraid he's dying. Get a doctor here immediately. Why, it's a terrible thing. There's really nothing any of us can say to comfort you. He... He poisoned Miriam. Yes, he told us just before he died. You don't think she really did come back to carry out her threat of revenge? I saw no one. 
I think Ray died of a guilty conscience. But, of course, it's true that there were finger marks on his throat, as if someone had choked him. And that is the part that is hard to figure out. mentioned in the hermit's cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. Now, folks, we are at the strawberry, and um, I took another one of these favorite story ones because I love the story of Joan of Arc, and um, I know I would never be as brave as she was, but uh, um, of course, she was scared to death pretty much anyway, but um, I I don't think I could have let him throw me on fire like that. But uh, nobody ever called me a hero either. <laughs> so, but this is a favorite story, and it's called Joan of Arc. And this is my strawberry. This will top off my butter pecan, and I'll have Cool Whip with it. This is Ronald Coleman. Inviting you to radio's most dramatic half hour. Favorite story. Have you ever wondered just what stories the most famous people in the world read and love? Well, this is the radio series which lets you look over their shoulders. For the plays you hear on favorite story have been handpicked, especially for you, by the most distinguished artists and world leaders of the 20th century. This week, our story was chosen by a lady with an Oscar, Academy Award winner Jennifer Jones. Miss Jones told us that the character she has always loved best in history and in fiction is the Maid of Lorraine, St. Joan of Arc. The story of this great heroine will star one of my favorite young actresses, Joan Loring. Here's Act One of Joan of Arc. Why do you sit here all day beside this old tree? Why don't you play with the other children? It is not meant that I should play, Uncle. Joan, my little Joan, are you well? What worries you? I cannot tell you, Uncle Johan. Once I told my father and he threatened to drown me if I ever spoke so again. I watch you from the house and many times I have seen you sink to your knees and cross yourself. And I have seen your eyes widen and your lips move. As if you were talking to the wind. You are so intent, especially when the church bells ring for martins. Or at twilight, when they play their night song. It is when the bells ring, Uncle, that I, I hear their voices most clearly. Oh, Do I... not be afraid, Joan. Many times they have said that, too. Do not be afraid, Maid of Domremy. 
For we bring you tidings from the kingdom of heaven. You will not drown me for telling you this. No, my child, but who are they, the voices you hear? The archangel Michael. He appears in a bright light, and his voice is clear and ringing, like a great bell in a cathedral. Then there is the blessed Saint Margaret and the beautiful Saint Catherine. Their voices are soft and gentle, like the wind. What do they say, child? Many things. Oh, many things. The Vespers. Uncle, they have come. Monsignor. Beyond. Beyond the maze. In God's name, what do you see, child? Blessed Saint Michael, I am here. I am listening. In all shining white, beyond the maze. Ride to all ends and raise the great siege, then anoint and crown Charles the Dauphin, King of France, in the great cathedral. If God is willing, I shall do these things. I shall help to save France in its hour of darkness. Long ago, there was a prophecy. I remember it so well. Jean d'Arc. St. Margaret. Jean de Pessieux. St. Catherine. Daughter of France. Go forth. Long ago, a prophecy. Out of Lorraine, beside the lady's tree, a maid shall come. Redeemer of France. Where is the Dauphin? I must see him. Ah, 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 here. Welcome to the poor man's court. To the grand ballroom of the king who is not a king. Where nobody has the courage to fight the English or the decency to die. Welcome. She has come, and he must know. She? Another dancing girl? To please the bloodshot eyes of our heir apparent without a spine, she, eh? She, she, the maid. Where is he? Where is the Dauphin? There in the corner, sewing a patch on his last remaining pad of breeches. Excuse me. I must talk to him. Your Majesty. Uh, your Majesty? Well, thank you. That's the very first time anybody's called me that in many weeks. Your Majesty. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. There. There, it's finished. You see? A royal patch. Your Majesty. She is here, the maid. I urge you to see her. She's waiting at the gates of Chinon. Uh, the milkmaid from Lorraine? Yes. Uh, she refuses to speak to my messengers. Because she has a message that must be delivered to you, and only to you. Well, perhaps she's a charlatan. But my advisors have told me to be wary of such charlatan. I have seen her face, sir. Never was there a face like that in this world. Purity shines from her eyes. I stake my honor and my manhood on this. She is no charlatan. Oh! You're in love with her. That's true, in a way. One look at her, and I'm in love with many things. With France, with honor, with God. Uh, come here, uh, closely, where the others cannot overhear. Do you really think it's possible this girl means to crown me king? Can such a thing be done? It can, Your Grace. I believe it. Robert de Baudricourt, as steady and sensible a soldier as you can find in Europe, believed her, and sent his lieutenants to escort her to you. You must see her, sir. Come to crown me king. Yes, Your Grace. And to aid you in fighting the invader. Oh. Well, I'd like the crowning part, but not the fighting. I, you know I'm not a fighting man. If the English and the Burgundians want to have Flanders and Picardy and, and, and Normandy, well, let them. Let them even have Orleans. But I'd really rather not fight. Will you see her and then judge? Uh, yes. Yes, and I have a plan. Good. I will bring her here directly. Yes. Uh, listen to me. I, I am about to see the maid. You think this is wise, Charles? I have an amusing idea. If she is indeed from God, as all the villagers from here to Domremy seem to be saying, then she should know me immediately. Should she not? I am not schooled in these matters, but I should think so. Uh, well, she has never seen me, never looked on my face or heard my voice. So, you and I shall change places. 
Here, uh, take my cloak and sit on the throne. A good jest. <laughs> a pleasant way to kill an hour. And if she proves to be just a child with a wild imagination, then we have one less legend on the wind to trouble us. Lords and ladies of the court, your majesty, here is Jean the maid. Yeah. Let her approach the throne. How strangely she is. Like a man. <laughs> it is the custom, my child, to kneel before the Dauphin. But you are not the Dauphin. I sit on the throne, maid. If I am not the Dauphin, who is then? He is in this room. I know. There, at the edge of the assembly, like a lost sheep. Oh. I kneel before you, gentle Dauphin. She, she knew. My name is Jeanne, and they call me the maid. And I have come to bring you tidings from the King of Heaven that I am to anoint you with holy oil and crown you King of France in the cathedral at Rheims. Ah, you're an amazing girl. You could tell that I'm a king and a true descendant of king. A trick. Why should it be a trick, Your Grace, when it is clear to anyone's eyes that the wrong man is sitting on the throne? <laughs> <laughs> I beg you, gentle Dauphin, let me speak to you alone for just one moment. It shall be done. Uh, clear the room. Clear the room. I, I grant this private audience to the maid of Lorraine. Be careful, Charles. And now, Charles of France, descendant of Charlemagne, let me see you in your rightful place on the throne. <laughs> Certainly. There. Does it please you better, maid, to see me as king on the throne? It pleases me to see you above those who have contrived to be above you. Eh? But you are not yet king, Charles. You are merely Dauphin. When you have knelt at the holy altar, and I have poured the holy oil on your head. Then all the people of France will arise and call you king. King Charles the Seventh of France. Oh, good, good. You speak well, maid. One boon only. One thing which must be done first. Ah. And that is? Give me a troop of fighting men of France for me to lead against the Englishmen. They are on French soil against God's will. Give me the men and armor to break the siege of Orléans. Then in triumph we can crown you king. Uh, how can you do this, girl, when the great generals of my armies cannot? My voices tell me so. Well, I do not like to fight. Do your voices not come from the peaceful saints? I, too, wish only peace. I, I wish to be left alone. It is wrong to fight as the English fight when they take our land. But if we do not fight for our own land, our own earth, we are cowards and do not deserve to be called men. Make a sign. Say a yes, and the people of your country will be united again. The kingdom of heaven it fights with you. I, I... I shall make your sign, Maid of Lorraine. Uh, come back, all of you. Uh, gather the court together. I have a proclamation to declare. Silence! Silence! Silence. This child has been sent to me, perhaps by God, perhaps by the long, silent will of the people. By God, gentle Dauphin. Know it in your heart. I believe it. Uh, listen to me, all of you. She is to have the armor and the men she needs. No. And she will lead our troops to Orléans. But I am head of the army. I name this maid head of the army. Of Charles the Seventh. You have your answer, old soldier. How about the rest of you? Who is with me and who is against me? I am with you, Maid of Lorraine. And I! To Orléans! To Orléans! For God and for France! <laughs> Continue with Act Two of Jennifer Jones' favorite story, Joan of Arc. The many lyric stories which have been written about the Maid of Lorraine tell us that she rode at the head of an army of inspired followers. Clothed in armor as silver as the sunshine, she carried a snow white banner on which was stamped a golden fleur de lis. Head erect, she rode against the enemies of her country. Listen to me. You, John Glansdale, who commands there. 
We order you to surrender in the name of the kingdom of heaven. Ha! Go home, cowgirl. <laughs> ah, the wind has changed, and the day is ours at last. Look behind you. You are surrounded on both sides. Countrymen, brothers, the order is charged. <laughs> I place the crown of Charlemagne upon your head, noble king. And now is accomplished the pleasure of God. John, the fleur de lis on your white banner is stamped forever on my heart. Lair, you are a good friend. I did not believe that in my time I should see such a miracle. We had faith. We believed. It is that simple. In dark days, my child, faith is the greatest miracle of all. But we must not stop here. Until Paris is ours, France is not really ours. I must see the king immediately. We must assemble our forces and march to the capital city. Jean, no. What is wrong, my friend? Go back to Dom Remy, to your father's house. Don't Your work is done. You have given the people of France a new standard, a lily white standard. But you must stop here. Something has happened. Tell me. Oh, I cannot. All I can say is go back to Lorraine while you can. You are my friend. Tell me. Very well. The man you made king of France. The man you crowned here with your own hands, Charles VII, ruler of the French people, has behind your back effected a treaty with the traitor Duke of Burgundy, pawn of the English. We do not march on Paris. <laughs> Jumped you two squares. Your move. Your Majesty. Eh? Oh, I hear. How dare you burst into my council chambers? I'm busy with affairs of state. A drafts game? Checkers, Your Majesty? Is that an affair of state? Well, certainly. Uh, there's an ancient French expression. Le roi s'amuse. The king must have a good time. Oh, dear. It's my move. This clown has me in a dreadful position. Your Majesty, I must have a word with you. Yeah, another time, another time. Oh, why am I? If I move there, you jump me here and get a king. Oh, there, there. Your Majesty, the English have captured Jean the Maid. Uh, so rumor has it. There, there. Now, try to get out of that situation. <laughs> uh, you know, I hear I'm getting quite adept at this. I may even take up uh, chess. Oh, no, no, I don't think so. Chess has all those knights and castles and bishops. It's much too much like war. Uh, your move. Your Majesty. Not now. The maid of Orléans, who crowns you king, is sitting chained to a filthy cell in Rouen. And the Inquisition will not try her as a prisoner of war, but as a witch. You must do something. You must ransom her. Well, I have no money. For the love of heaven, you sit here today because of one person only. Jean Le Pucelle. If she's in difficulty, let her voices tell her what to do. After all, I never asked her to fight toward Compiègne. That was her idea. And her voices. As I see it, here, it's all like a game of checkers. When you make a move and lose the game, who's to blame but yourself? Eh? Eh? the maid. What do you want of me now? We will ask the questions. They have asked so many questions. I have no answers left. Silence. I will speak. 
long enough to say you have no right to chain me like a dog in that dark and gloomy cell. The soldiers do not let me alone, not for a moment. They swear and curse at me. I cover my ears, but I still hear them. That is irrelevant to our business here today. <clears throat> Maid, hear us. Do you swear on the gospel you will answer nothing but the truth? Well? Perhaps you will ask me things that I will not tell you. You are a young girl, uneducated. I am old. I have questioned many prisoners. Take my advice, child. Do not give impertinent answers. It will gain you nothing. We will try to be kind with you. Then be kind. Will you swear? No, I will not swear because your standards of truth are not the same as mine. Girl, do you know that if you are not civil, if you do not give us a chance to prove that you are not a heretic, we will be forced to... To burn me at the stake like a witch. I know that. But why don't you give me a fair trial with my own people present? Give me an advocate, a witness. My uncle, my, my playmates, my lieutenants, my king. Where is he? You are holy men. And yet what kind of mockery is it? Ask yourselves this. What kind of mockery is it to be tried by one's own enemies? This is a court of law. Not a forum where we conduct a philosophic discussion. Uh, we will proceed with the questions even without the oath. Maid of Dom Remy, you claim you hear voices? Yes. Whose voices do you hear? The Archangel Michael and the blessed saints Margaret and Catherine. Did you see them as well as hear them? Yes. What do they look like? Describe them. I will not answer that. I am not permitted to say. Because you do not know. Because they are figments of your imagination. And you did not actually see them any more than you actually heard them. I have seen them. As clearly as I see you sitting before me. I have heard their voices. I have spoken with them. I have embraced them. And all I have done has been at their bidding. And through them, the bidding of God. You realize that with every word you speak, you are confessing heresy. Why? Because you dare to pretend that you're in a state of grace. If I am not, may God bring me to it. If I am, may God keep me in it. You'll leave us no alternative. I am forced by my office to press all the charges against you. You do not deny that you have intercourse with evil spirits, and therefore a sorceress. Secondly, you wear men's clothes, which is an abomination against all decency. Are the saints evil spirits? How do you know they are saints? I know. How do you know which saint is which? Are they dressed, or do they appear to you naked? Do you think our Lord is so poor he has nothing to dress them in? In what language do they speak? Do they address you in English? Why should they speak in English when they are not on the English side? Girl, I warn you for the last time to recant, to abjure, to take back these heresies. You want me to say these things because you want the people not to believe. You are afraid, all of you, when a single person has faith in himself and his God. Because you know then that all of you in authority will be stripped bare with nothing to do. Turn her over to the secular authorities. Tell them to prepare the fire in the marketplace immediately. Today? You have made your choice. Sign this or you go to the stake this very day. No. You're within seconds of your doom, child. Now sign. Oh, God. It starts with a smoldering flame. You can barely feel it. And then it builds. It builds. It will be cruel, not swift. Listen to me. You can still save yourself. Do you not see that your voices have deceived you? No. Have they helped you? Have they come to your aid for a single second since your capture at Compiègne? Have they, girl? And this king you crown, would he give his life for you? Well... And you have saved yourself. What do you want me to do? Sign this. What does it say? I will read it to you. 
I, Joan the Maid, a miserable sinner, do confess that I have pretended to have revelations from God and the blessed saints, and that these were really temptations by demons. I confess to the sins of heresy and blasphemy, and renounce and abjure all I've said and done. Declare it all false and untrue, and witness thereto I sign this recantation. Do you understand this, Jean? Is it true? Must be true, otherwise the stake would not be standing in the marketplace. Take the pen. There. You have saved yourself, child. This court rules, however, that though you will not burn at the stake for all the harm you have done to the simple people of France, you are sentenced to spend the remainder of your earthly days in prison. I am not to be set free. Set free, girl? After all your wickedness? But I thought that you said I... Not seen you. Why do you sink to your knees? This is the verdict of the court. It will do you no good to appeal to us in this way. Blessed Saint Michael, I am here. I am listening. Who are you speaking to? This court orders you to rise to your feet. Yes. Yes. You. You said my voices were false and that they deceived me. But it was you who deceived me. Give me that paper. Give me your lies and may all the world know and remember what I did with them. John! John! Now! Take me to your stake and burn me. And if you think for a moment that when my body is gone, I will be dead, you are wrong, Inquisitor. I will live. I will live. I will live. our play about the meteoric life of one of the most tragic heroines who ever walked this earth, St. Joan of Arc. Our thanks and appreciation to Joan Loring, who played the title role with extraordinary skill, and to all the members of the cast and orchestra. And we're grateful to Miss Jennifer Jones, who chose St. Joan of Arc as her favorite story. We're going to bring you Fred Allen's favorite story next week. You'd expect Fred to pick a comedy for you. But as a matter of fact, he chose a story that is the exact opposite of comedy. It's a masterpiece of sheer terror. Frankenstein. We've arranged an exciting production of Mary Shelley's original novel, The Hair-Raising Adventures of the Man Who Made a Monster. We hope you'll be listening. See you picking up your purses and your coats and your jackets and your knapsacks or whatever the case may be. Um, you're welcome to stay as long as you like, but, well, I guess you'll be staying by yourself. <laughs> I, I, I think I'll just have a big old hoe down and uh, uh, I'll, I'll just invite everybody down to my apartment and we'll have a ball yeah I can just see a bunch of people in this little bitty apartment I can barely fit me and the cat in it <laughs> but um, anyway y'all have a good week and I'll look forward to seeing you next time and I hope you enjoy what I've put together for you today bye bye and God bless <laughs> <laughs>